We were looking at the idea of time value of money, and we ended off with this example where we said if we're investing $1,000 four times, so you've got four occasions to receive this $1,000, that money devalues over time. And it's a little bit of a weird concept to wrap your head around the first time you see this. For those of you that have some business and management experience, you, you, you're comfortable with time value of money. But the rest of you, it may take a while to get used to it. But we do have an intuitive experience with it. And the way I wrote it on the board last time is you can see it as a money equivalence. That, for example, if you had $909 today, the amount of goods or material or product that you purchase with that $909, a year from now, in an environment with 10% time value of money, you're going to have to spend $1,000 next year. So in a year from now, that same amount of material and goods is going to cost you a little bit more. So that's looking at it from that perspective. You can also see it from the perspective that if someone gave you $909 now and you invested at 10%, you're going to have grown it to $1,000 next year. Okay, so you can see it both from a deflationary perspective as well as from an investment perspective. And um, we're going to rely on this topic quite a bit. And the reason is because we're going to be looking at cash flows next year, the year after, and for about 20, 15, 15, 20, maybe longer years once a plant is built and running. And we want to bring all those future cash flows, those future monies flowing in, the sales that you get from your product 15, 20, 30 years from now, as well as the expenses, the costs to produce that product. All of those future monies we're going to discount and bring back to present day dollars. Okay? And so we have a, a convenient formula that links the past and the future for us. And you've seen it over and over that F is equal to P plus 1 plus I raised to the power N. So that's our connection between present and future, present value and future value. Okay, so I left you with this example in the class, and I said, well, if someone gave you four payments of $1,000, you can discount that payment in the first year, in other words, the second period. Sorry, I should say the second period, N equals one. That $1,000 then is worth $909 in today's money. The $1,000 two years from now is only worth $826. The next one is worth $751. If we sum them up, you get 3, 4, 8, 7. Okay. So someone could have instead given you $3,487 right now as a single payment today, and it would be the equivalent of them giving you four payments spread out over time. Okay. Now, I'd asked you at the end of the last class to go prove to yourself that you can also see this as the concept of taking $3,487, investing it at 10% returns, and that it will, if you draw $1,000 payments out of that, end up with a zero balance. Anyone had a chance to do that? And prove it to yourself. Oh, I know you haven't, so let me quickly do it with you. Okay, this is really important to link the present and the future. So let's get that going. So what I'd hoped you would have done with this is to prove that three, four, eight, seven dollars is my starting balance in the period n equals zero. Okay, and what I'd hoped you'd looked at is that's your starting balance in that very first period. So this is your start balance. You make a withdrawal right in that first year of $1,000. Okay, so that's $1,000 you, you would have had needed in that first year. And so your balance after that is 2487. So your remaining balance is 2487. Now, you've got that left over in a bank account to invest at 10% interest. I'm looking at it now from an investment perspective. That 
spreadsheet up there on the projector is looking at it from a deflationary perspective, from a time value of money. But let's look at it from the investing perspective, which is just flipped around. So the interest earned on that is how much? 10%, you're earning the interest there of $249. Okay. So we're just always going to ignore our cents, just simply round. So $249 interest is earned. And then you have in your bank account available to you 2736. And now you're in period n equals 1. You need $1,000 from that account, so you withdraw 1000 and you're left with 1736. What's the interest earned on that in that period? 174. And you get to carry that over, and then you balance the next period, n equals 1. Uh, n equals 2 is the sum of the prior two values. So it's 1736 plus 174 gets carried over. So in the same way I took that sum, carried it over, I'm going to take that sum and carry it over here, and I get a balance of 1910. Okay. Yes. 10%. It was 10%. So 1910, you need $1,000, you withdraw that 1,000, you've got 910 left in your bank account, earning at 10% interest, that's $91 of interest. And so then in your final period, the fourth year, N equals 3, you carry that balance over and you get $1,001. And there's a little bit of rounding error that started to accumulate here. It, should be about a, it would be 1,000 if you're doing this in a spreadsheet. Okay, and you make your final withdrawal, and you've drawn it down to $0 left over. Okay. So that 3487 is a value that someone could have given you right now, today, at n equals 0. You can grow it at 10% interest, still making these payments, with these withdrawals four times of $1,000. So every time in this period, you're getting $1,000 cash and you're doing, spending it on whatever you're spending. Okay. Yes, Mark. Um, the 249 and like the interest, is that on the, the 3487 or even the... This remaining balance. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it was the, the I was 10%. Okay, from the previous example. Yeah, so inflation rate up there was 10%. Okay, so you can, some people get this from an inflation perspective. Other people like to see it more from an interest earned perspective. What my point is with this example is in the slides, you've got it looking at it from a deflation perspective. Here on the board, you've got it from an investment perspective. You get the same results, same interpretation. Okay. So we have to be comfortable with that idea. Now, there's still a bit of confusion, and it's, it takes a while to get used to this, to the idea of that your first period is n equals zero. So that's your first year, second year, third year, fourth year. It's no different to your birthdays, right? When you're born, you don't get born at one year of age. You're born at zero, and you celebrate your first birthday 365 days later. But that day is actually the start of your second year of your life, okay? Yeah? The, your first birthday is a celebration that you've lived one year, but it's not saying, hello, I'm one year old. You're one year old, you've lived 365 days, but it's the start of your second year, that same day, okay? So your zeroth year, your first year, your second year. Think of it carefully, it's no different to the birthdays that people celebrate. If you're read obituaries, you'll often see so-and-so in their 37th year, okay? They're actually 36 years old, but they're in their 37th year. So you'll see that often. It's the same idea here. Your n equals zero is your first period, n equals one is your second period, and so on. 
And we do it not because we like to think of it as birthdays, but we simply do it for mathematical convenience that we have an n over there. And that in our first period, our zeroth n equals zeroth period, our first period, we have no time value of money. We're saying that period is short enough that nothing has really changed with the value of our money. If you're living and working in an environment where that assumption is not true, you should modify your calculations. So here I'm using a period of one year. If one year, that approximation that the value of money is not constant, then you should absolutely go down to a monthly resolution, a month by month period. And if that's even not sufficient, go to a daily. Okay, so we're simply using annual periods because over the 20 years of a chemical plant, it's a pretty reasonable assumption. And we also don't want monster spreadsheets with many, many columns and rows. Okay, so we'll, we'll use annual periods and, because that assumption holds. But be careful, if you're working in an environment or in a company where that's not true, you'd need to just modify it. Any questions on these concepts so far? Yes. Yeah. So if in, in a question you're considering a five-year period, you know that it's n equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. That's five years. In the next tutorial in assignment, we're going to look at longer durations, like 18, 20, 25 years. So then you're going to have to be careful with how you deal with it. Sometimes what people do is they'll just create a spreadsheet and add an extra column here, 1, 2, 3, 4, just so that it's easier to keep track of. The relationships. Okay. You can go. You can. You can work it either way. So, as I was saying to the tutorial group this this morning. On the course website, there's the spreadsheets for that $10,000 invested example. And you'll see side by side, I've shown you the case when you're assuming you get the payment for the interest right in this period or you get it the following period. And over a long period of time, it washes out as being fairly minor. There's obviously one is more in your favor than the other, but the distinction is fairly minor. And so I don't make a big deal of it in this course. If you work with it one way, that's fine. If you work with it another way, that's, that's fine. In practice, you would know which way your company is operating. But you're not going to be making a significant mistake in your investment decision either way. OK, so I want you to take a minute to think about the following and discuss it for a while with the person around you. You're rich. You have $100,000 to invest. You have two or three options to invest it in. You're only going to pick one. What criterion, what single criterion are you going to use to choose between those investments? And what value is that criterion going to have to make you convince yourself that it's a good investment? So two things. What is the criterion? And what is the numeric value of that criteria? OK, so take a few minutes and, and discuss how you would make that decision.
Okay, let's hear some suggestions. Yuma is going to go first, and then. Um, net present value. Okay, you're going to go right to net present value. What's your criterion? So if net present value is greater than zero, you have, you have to If it's less than zero, you don't have to Okay, so someone's taken engineering and management. <laughs> Unfair advantage here. Okay, so NPV. Anyone else? Sean. Uh, So you're choosing between two or three projects, and how often interest is compounded. So as long as those projects have different compounding rates. Yeah, like depending on you know, how it's going to go through the future, if there's one where whatever you're putting out, you're going to end up making money differently based on like compounding rates of your investment there. OK. You might be making actually more money. OK, so if different investments had different compounding rates, that would be a, a criteria that you'd use. So yeah. Okay, so the risk, and uh, so I just want to get uh, compounding from Sean. Uh, you said the rate, the rate of rate of return. Okay, so we've got a concept here, rate of return being mentioned. Right. Payback relative to inflation. So we've got. Payback relative to inflation, it's a, got two concepts there. Okay, rate of return was the other one. Other ideas? Okay, so we've all got one of these devices in our pocket, and when you buy one of the, them these days, you generally get two decisions. Either you pay a monthly rate over a two-year period, or you can buy it outright ahead of time. Okay, so there's two investment decisions, two options. Which one do you go for? How many of you are on a contract, a monthly contract? How many of you bought your device outright? Okay, so we've got some people going one way, some people the other way. Right, so there's a there's a decision there. Why? What what drove that decision? Um, Julia? It would be the monthly payment, like the monthly bill was cheaper if you had your own phone. Okay, so the the monthly bill was cheaper for you, for you if you had your own phone already. So you've bought the phone outright ahead of time. Yeah. You would pay more for the phone if you buy it for two years rather than to just buy it right now. Okay, so you would, you would end up paying more for the phone over two years if you go with the monthly portion than if you buy it outright. Shove it. Okay. It's better to go over the contract. Okay. okay. So we're starting to bring in multiple criteria here. Yeah? So if you go with the contract, you're tied down. Anyone else? Brandon? 
Okay, so you may not have $750 to go buy the new iPhone 6, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Sean? That's the plan, and use the extra money you would have used to buy the phone to invest and make more. <laughs> okay, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> so you buy the plan, you save that extra money, and you invest it elsewhere at a better return. Okay, so that, yeah, I'm ready. Okay, what's the life expectancy or your expected time for keeping that phone for two years? You might graduate and then stop, move overseas and now you're stuck with a phone, right? Yeah. Uh, so you just, okay, so you just keep moving over to a new phone every year or two. Yeah. Okay, so there's exactly, you guys have faced these sorts of decisions. Was there something at the back there? No? Okay. So you face these sorts of decisions. How do you evaluate what criterion, singular, or criteria, plural, do you use? And what are the cutoffs to decide that one option is better than the other? Okay. That's what this next section is about. So we've covered up till now the idea that time value of money Money doesn't have a constant value. It's degrading its value over time if we just let it stand by itself. Now we're going to start to consider ideas of how do we judge between one option versus the other. And many of you have raised va valid alternatives. Let's take a look at a few of those in detail and what's, what's involved with them. From a practical point of view and where this is used is, I mean, obviously there's these daily examples that you can choose to maybe buy a, a house and rent it out. Okay. Do you buy a house in Westdale or do you buy the house in Ancaster and rent it out? You're going to rent it out no matter what. <laughs> okay, you're going to rent it out in Westdale. What criterion might you use then between those two investments? So, Rachel? Okay, risk of damages from your tenants, yeah. Mark? Yeah, like essentially what your revenue is, what are you going to be paying for what you're going to be getting back. So if you're like, what you're going to be paying back, you're going to pay more of a tax each year. So there's going to be higher costs incurred with that investment in, West, uh, in, in Ancaster, but you've got higher re revenue potential perhaps. Well, let's say you've got only $300,000. Can you buy a house in Ancaster even with that? Okay, and if you rented it out, you're probably not going to be renting it out to high quality tenants, but you could argue the same in Westdale. So there's also, there's, there's, but where, where, you had a comment there, Adam? No, I was just, yeah, I was just saying you could probably do it higher rent. For sure. Okay, so if you had more money to buy a better house in Ancaster, you'd, you'd get it back. So some of the concepts that people use intuitively are how fast are you going to recover the amount of money for that rental property? So if you buy the house in Westdale and it's going to cost $400,000, how many years or months is it going to take before you've recovered that $400,000? How many rental months cycles go by before you recover that money? There's one option there. We call that payback time, the time taken to recover that investment. And that's the first one we're going to look at over here. So I'll, I'm going to jump over two, three slides. I'll come back to them in a minute. But I do want to just go here to this idea of payback time. It's really an important one because it's used so frequently. So we'll come back to the other slides. We're just at slide 39 in this discussion. And payback time is used so widely, I, I want us to really understand what's going on here and emphasize that it's not an appropriate way to judge an investment over a long period of time. So a two, three year investment, it's not a big deal to use payback time. But over a longer duration, you're going to make some serious errors if you use payback time. Now payback time has, by definition, units of time. So it's the time it takes to pay that investment back. And the important part is that it's the cumulative cash flow on that investment has to reach zero. So let's take a look at this. A very crude example, you spend $100,000 and you're going to get $10,000 generated as money from that $100,000 investment. You spent 100,000, 
You get 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000, 10,000. It's going to take 10 years to pay back the 100,000. That's payback time. The duration it takes to recover the cost of that investment. So it says cumulative cash flow. So let's take a look at that. Cumulative cash flow is there's time. You sink in $100,000, negative. $100,000 goes down. 10000 for the next 10 years. But that's not my cumulative cash flow diagram. My cumulative cash flow diagram is 10000 down, and then I go up, up. Well, I'm taking steps that are too big. Um, so you're going to take 10 steps up before you reach zero. Okay, so there's one, two, three. You get the idea. And it's going to take 10 steps to get to a value of zero. So it's the time that it takes for your cumulative cash flow curve to cross zero. Now, I've drawn it here as little steps, but what we'll typically do is we'll say it's a smooth line, even though there's a bit of discrete behavior there. So how long does it take to go from your start of your investment to this point that it crosses zero? And then after that, it can still keep going up, but it's that duration of time. So right there, you see why this is a crude metric, because it doesn't consider what happens after you've crossed zero. That house doesn't evaporate and disappear after the 10th year. It's, you still own it as an investment. It's still generating revenue. You should be accounting for that. So pay, that's why payback time is so crude, because it just simply ignores what happens after the zero crossing. But the zero crossing is just an event which says you've broken even. Your income equals your expenses is all that that's saying. Okay. So it's a very crude, crude way to judge profitability. But it is intuitive. Your boss is going to understand it. Your parents are going to understand it. Non-technical friends and family are going to understand it. And that's why it's used so frequently. But we do need to be a bit more sophisticated. We do need to take the time value of money into account. And this does not do that. OK, so there's one measure of, of profitability I've discussed. Why are we looking at profitability metrics even? OK, and you've answered that a little bit yourself with this discussion you've had. We need metrics to judge between alternative investments. Not just between buying a cell phone on a contract versus buying a cell phone outright. But when it comes to chemical processes and investments, remember that very first example I gave in class about the distillation column. There were five alternatives there. The first one was that you replace the distillation column. Sorry, you buy a second parallel distillation column. The second option was you enhance the capability of your existing distillation column. The third one was that you contract out manufacturing to another company. And there were two others. There's four or five alternatives there. We need to come up with a spreadsheet that says what our criterion is going to be and compare them between the five investments. And then secondly, we're going to need some number that says one investment is better than the other. So we're going to need some way to judge one investment is better than an alternative. So when it comes to payback time, what, how are you going to judge two alternatives? Okay, whichever investment pays back fastest. So the faster the payback time, the better it is. Okay, so when it comes to comparing expenses up here, it says here on the slide, we need a profitability metric and we need some minimal acceptable performance. So companies, if they're using payback time, they might say five years. And as long as it pay back, pays back within zero to five years, that's a good investment. Anything that's longer than five years, they're not going to consider. That might be a, a threshold that each company, and you'll start to see this going forward, each company will have different thresholds. There's no single cutoff value that's correct or not. Different companies will have different levels of risk and accept different <coughs> payback times or different criteria thresholds, OK? Let me just see what I jumped over here. OK. That's right. I do also want to talk about, before we go look in some other alternatives, the idea of 
non-profit organizations, governments, charities, universities even, um, because many of you are not going to work just for a corporation where their sole motive is profit. Here in the university, even though it might seem that they're out to gouge your money, they generally aim at creating things that break even. So if, uh, let's say, the university's labs here in BSB are deciding to replace their computers, they can either buy them or they can rent them. They're going to choose the option that, that saves them money. Right? They're not going to choose the most expensive option. They're not in that business of trying to recover that investment. So even nonprofits need to dis make those sorts of decisions. Charities, they might decide, well, do we invest in a print campaign, a social media campaign, a television campaign? What options do we invest in that will get the greatest rate of return? Governments do that as well. It's government um, financing is a whole different beast, and we won't go into that in this course, but I can give you an intuitive understanding of that in this way. If corporations were in charge of building bridges and roads and highways and hospitals and large-scale infrastructure items, and they looked at them purely from a profitability metric, they wouldn't ever invest in them. They would never get built. Okay? Governments are willing to take a 90, 100-year time frame and invest in roads and railways and bridges and, and large-scale infrastructure that corporations generally would not touch because the payback time and investment rates of return and NPVs on those big items are not in anyone's favor. Okay? So governments do take a look at these sorts of metrics, but by and large, again, governments are not out to build a highway to recover money or make money as a profitable venture from it. Okay? So, so there are these sorts of decisions that are made in a whole variety of industries, but we're going to generally assume that you're working for corporations and they're going to be looking at these metrics that we're going to look at next, payback time, rates of return, and others. Okay. So any questions on that before, before moving on? Or any comments? Anyone done a co-op term and, and had a look at some of these sorts of financial indicators that we've mentioned so far? Nope. Okay, I, I'll, I mean, one, one, it wasn't a co-op term, but a one-year contract I had at GlaxoSmithKline. We were, I was in charge of purchasing a, a tablet machine that inspects the tablets for defects, and we were looking at some alternatives. One, the one alternative was manual inspection, so renting a crew of 20 people to come in and manually check the tablets or computer automated system. And I had to prepare one of these financial flow sheets I'll show you next. And it was the payback time on the automated machine was a little longer, but was also more reliable than human inspection. So once you factor in the cost of a bad human inspector versus a machine that's generally doing it okay, then it the payback time was a matter of a few months. So the machine paid for itself in, in terms of months. And the rates of return were, were very high, high enough that the company just went straight ahead and bought the automated machine. But we did, there was a, a lot of careful financial justification. And that was the CEO in London was on the conference call. And that was his first question was, what's the payback time? What's the rate of return? Okay, and because the CEO is sitting there of a larger corporation and she or he's responsible for investing the money in a number of projects. And the way this company operated was every month there was a conference call between all their divisions internationally and every company bids on projects that they want funded by the central, central head office. And as long as your project had the right economics, you would get the money but you had one opportunity once a month to get that money from the company. And the company, if the economics was not right, instead of sending the money to Canada, it's going to go to Singapore or to India or to Italy or whichever other division in the company can get a greater rate of return or faster payback times. Okay? So you'll certainly see this. And when you're on that conference call with the CEO, you have to know what he means or she means with these terms of rate of return and payback time and so forth. Okay, so let's take a look at a bit of that. So rate of return, uh, sorry, let's, uh, payback time. Let's take a look at this cash flow 
diagram. And the idea here on slide 38 is you've got $91,000 to invest. So you're going to sink in $91,000. The first year you're going to get $20,000, then $40,000, then $40,000, then $40,000, then $30,000. Okay. Should you invest in that project or should you instead take your money and simply deposit it in a bank account and get 15% interest? So there's always two alternatives, as I said in this course. Either you, buy, you invest in a project, or you simply keep your money and invest it in a bank account. So if you have the, now this is a very high interest rate, it's probably artificially high, but let's say 15% is there as a cutoff value that you're willing to accept in a bank account, or should you invest it in this, would you get a higher rate of return? So we're gonna to get to answering that in a minute, but let me take this a step further and ask you to use those data and now calculate the payback time. How fast is that investment going to pay back? Four months? Yep. No. It's not a trick question. Maybe just do a bit of calculation. No, let's ignore interest. Just simply pure payback time. The, use that definition of payback time, which says cumulative cash flow crosses zero. Okay. Doesn't matter. Let's say these are years. How many years is the payback time? Three years, four years? Two years. Do it. Do it. Do the calculations on paper. Okay, so it's uh, straightforward. We've got zero, one, two, three, four, five. There's the first year you got a negative 91,000. Then you got the 20,000. What I'm going to just plot here, and you can add this as an extra column onto your slide. Let's call this column uh, cumulative cash flow. Okay, so the first year you start at negative 91,000. After 20,000 20, flows in, you're at a balance of minus 71, 93. Then in your next period, you're at minus 31, 0, 073. And then you're at 8907. Positive, and then 48, 907. Okay, so what's your payback time? It's not a trick question. <laughs> Three years? Three years? Three More than three? More than Less than four? Okay, let's, if this is bothering you, I don't know, a lot of hesitation here. So here's your zeroth period. Here's your cumulative cash flow. You're at negative 91,000. So there's your n equals zero. That's your first year. By the end of that first year, you're at negative 71. By the end of that next year, you're at negative 31,000. Then you're at minus, sorry, you're at plus, right? Plus 8,907.
and then you're into your third period. So if you looked at your cash flow, your cumulative cash flow, it would be there, there. So how many years? Two point seven. Okay, not three. <laughs> this always causes an issue. It's funny. It's quite straightforward. There's one year, there's two years, there's 0.7 years. 2.7. If you look at the table, your intuition is going to tell you it's more than three, and you're going to be wrong. It's time. How, how long? That's the key. Payback time. And that's why it always causes a confusion. Okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so their conclusion is this is we wouldn't hit into the black until the end of the year, right? Yeah. So how do we we don't have that money yet to say to pay that finish? Right. But I mean it's a linear interpolation. Money flows in and out quickly. Yeah. It's yeah. It's, it's certainly it's not more than three years, okay? It's it's between two to three years, and, and that would be a correct answer to say. But you'd want to see that if we have a number to do it, you'd want the exact 0.60. Yeah, but you would simply say it's between two to three years. It's oh. the, un the incorrect answer is between three and four years. When you look at the table, you think it's between three to four years, but it's not. It's between two to three years that it takes. Okay, so just follow the definition. The cumulative cash flow crosses zero. You can see that over here and look at the spreadsheet online to get, generate that plot. There in the, in the red is the cumulative cash flow. In the blue is the actual cash uh, flows. The net cash flows in the red is the cumulative. When it crosses zero, it's 2.7 years. Okay. So as I said, their payback time is not a useful metric. It doesn't take into account the time value of money. So it's a, at best, it's a good screening tool to, invest, to consider between multiple investments. But it's not a great one, especially when you're dealing with long periods of time. Here's an interesting example that demonstrates a bit of the failure of payback time. If you had that same $91,000 investment, and instead of having, as you saw there, incomes of 20,000, 40,000, 40,000, 40,000, instead of that, your incomes were 34,000, just even 34, 34, 34,000, you get the same payback time. So different cash flows coming in, but the same payback time. You're starting to see what the problem is here is that $20,000 flowing into your bank account next year and $40,000 the year after, that's got a very different value, especially when you take the fact that the money is worth less and less every year. Whereas equal amounts of $34,000 also, they've got declining value over time. So not accounting for time value of money is, should be starting to bother you here. I'm hoping that you get comfortable with this idea. We should be accounting for the fact that money is depreciating in value. Okay. Any questions so far on that? Very, very simple, but there is some complexity behind it. Yes, Brent. It doesn't take into account the trajectory. That would be a good way of saying it. Absolutely, it doesn't take into account the trajectory. It also doesn't take into account anything that happens beyond that zero crossing point. You still hold the investment after that point. You're still making money on it, so you should account for that. Right? You could have two investments where you invest the same amount of money down here initially, and it pays back like that, and then keeps going at that rate. But you could have a second investment that does that, would be a better alternative. Okay? So it, the trajectory or the velocity of the money, so business people have heard of the terms of velocity of cash, um, is an important part of it. 
how fast those payments come to you or go out of your bank account. Yeah? No, it doesn't take the fact that, well, interest rates would be the, the idea that money is declining in value over time. It's the, the reverse perspective. So as I've, over the past few days, we've recovered the idea that interest rates are the opposite of inflation. So yeah, it doesn't, does not not take into account the time value of money. Okay, so payback time is good for screening, but not good for too much else. Let's take a look at one other final concept here, and that's ROI, return on investment. Now, there's, a, there's one definition for it, return on investment. And next class, we'll talk a little bit about what we mean by working capital and fixed capital. But I want you to simply see ROI as the following. ROI is often just simply a sales or money coming in minus your investment divided by your investment. Okay, so that's what that numerator is. Profit is simply income minus expenses or sales minus investment is a crude way of seeing that divided by what you started off with. And it's clear that with this value, the higher it is, the better. The numerator, if it's a higher value, you generate more profit for the same investment, that that's a better deal. Okay, but we'll come, next class, I'll, I'll spend some time talking about, about that denominator. What do I mean by working capital? And what do I mean by fixed capital? You can go research those two terms. That would be a good idea. But then one final point for today is um, two things, actually. Um, many of you know it's super crawl. Yes? No? Good. So go out, experience super crawl, very unique to Hamilton. Um, I'll probably see you around there at that. Second thing, assignments for this course are due always on a Wednesday. So your electronic assignments for your groups Wednesday at class time, but you're not going to hand me anything in paper. You're going to do it entirely electronically. So make sure you follow the instructions carefully. Now there's one important thing. Many of you are going to make a mistake with that first assignment. You're going to email the document to me or the TA, and that's not allowed. You're going to email me a Word document or a PDF, and that's not allowed either. Make sure you follow the details on the course website. Next, make sure you have a cover letter. No cover letter, there's a pretty big penalty for that. Okay? Part of the important part of this course is communication skills and a cover letter is an important part of that. There's some sample cover letters on the website for you to take a look at. Okay, see you next week. <laughs>